Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is Mark Ellis. Welcome one and all to the best movie news show in the entire galaxy. My name is Mark, and this is the only show that, just like pizza, is just as good three days later. On today's <laughs> show, we have babies fighting Smurfs, Wonder Woman is fighting tracking, and Jason Statham might ride a giant shark. Ashley, who's joining me today? Also here is Jeremy Johns. Wacky Wednesday was a lot of fun. Looking forward to Manic Monday. <laughs> Welcome, <laughs> everyone. Welcome. Also here is Perry Nemiroff. I don't care what certain people on this panel say. Do not put pizza in your coffee ever. Oh, good. <laughs> also, here's John Schnapp. Just another manic Monday. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Pizza is fun day. Mm, if it's cold, yes, it's... Oh, <laughs> that got really melancholy. That was like a care tune. Like, it started out really peppy, then it got kind of depressing. I know. I to tell me, tell me, tell me. You know, but I was Schnapp almost ate four slices of cold pizza. He couldn't quite do it before he went to camera. But on the bright side of things, we do have some breaking news. A trailer dropped. Is Thor going to fight Hulk? Ashley, tell me what happened. Marvel and Disney have released the very first teaser trailer for Thor Ragnarok. Directed by Taika Waititi, the one minute and 52 second spot uses Led Zeppelin's Immigrant Song to set the stage for a Marvel movie unlike anything the fans have seen yet. With Thor in prison on the other side of the universe without his mighty hammer, he finds himself in a race against time to get back to Asgard to stop Ragnarok, the destruction of his homeland, his home world, and the end of Asgardian civilization at the hands of an all-powerful new threat, the ruthless Hela. But first, he must survive a deadly gladiator contest that pits him against his former ally and fellow Avenger, the Incredible Hulk. It hits theaters on November 3rd, 2000. 17. Mark, what do you think of the first teaser trailer for Thor Ragnarok? Uh, much like Robert Plant on Led Zeppelin 3, I was going crazy watching this the entire time. I laughed, I got excited. It didn't give us a lot of the story at all, and I didn't want that. I just wanted to see some cool visuals from what we were teased last year at Comic Con this past summer. We got to see, like, oh, maybe there's going to be some Planet Hulk stuff. This concept or it's, it's showing some really neat visions of Hela, and then getting to see Thor. He loses his hammer, he loses most of his hair, but that scene when he sees Hulk in the arena for the first time and just this big smile on my face. I think everybody watching the trailer got that same smile on their face because they, they, they had this weird buddy cop relationship, but at the end of the day, you know they're going to be able to team up and do some damage. So I was like a pig in slop the entire time watching this Minute 52 trailer. John Schnepp, this is something that was uh, looking forward to by you. What do you oh, think? Yeah. Everything it delivered on all fronts. I absolutely love this trailer. Right when I woke up this morning, I was like, I wonder what the notes are. What? It's, I think I watched it like eight times in a row. Uh, so fantastic. Exactly what I wanted. You know, I mean, let me just get to the trolls for a second. You guys, you got to relax. And people are like, how could, how could a woman smash Thor's hammer? I read something like that. It was like, wow. Not only are you an idiot for saying that, but it's also it's Hela. She's in control. She runs Valhalla. She basically runs the Norse, Norse god's heaven. She's the most powerful form of death that they love. They look forward to joining Valhalla. So I'm interested to see how they portray Hela. Obviously, she's playing some kind of a villain. She destroys Asgard. And that's all going to be probably told in the first like 10 minutes of the movie because we get that Thor hanging in chains. And he's like, let me tell you a little story. He's still got his long hair. So you know that he's not even on Planet Hulk yet. So everything about this film, Jeff Goldblum, everything <laughs> about this film, a purse, a, a, it looked like a, a, a warrior woman on a, a giant bird with a, a, with a <laughs> sword. I was like, bring this to me now. I cannot wait to see this movie. I loved it. Barry, warrior woman, giant swords, <laughs> birds. You get your Jeff Goldblum, you get a little bit of Idris Elba. You mentioned you saw Carl Urban in there oh, as yeah. well. Yes. What was your favorite part he of the He didn't even look like Carl Urban. He looks like the executioner. That's his okay. name. Okay. <laughs> um, I liked a lot of this trailer. I freaking love this trailer overall. I wish this movie was coming out this weekend. It's going to kill me now. And what a great way to start with the tease, because you said that it didn't have much story, which I don't think it really did, where it showed you exactly what the plot of the movie was or how these things connect. However, it did have a couple of really important story beats there and story beats that can still make folks excited without knowing the entire story of the movie. So that's a huge way to be able to start and then be able to follow it up with a full story trailer. 
damn though, this movie looks great. It looks great, and most important of all, it feels like it's gonna be so much fun. And this is exactly what I would have expected and what I would have wanted from a Taika Waititi directed MCU movie. Wow, I really, not that I didn't expect it to be great, but I didn't expect it to be this great. I'm so freaking excited. Now, Jeremy, a guy like you, you grow up loving Thor and Hulk. They're together in an arena and they're having a good time. How about you watching the trailer? Oh, uh, yeah, I like the, the buddy cop reference you said because, I mean, that's how, this trailer did what I think the trailer needed to do, which is when the pictures came out, it's Jeff Goldblum looked kind of strange and neon. He ultimately everyone looked like they were in a bunch of armor from the game Destiny, where it's like very <laughs> bright pinks and greens. I thought it was you know? yeah. perfectly in time with Easter. There's a lot of pastel colors in <laughs> right, this trailer. Right, right. They look like colored Easter eggs. So you have to see something like that in motion, and then now you see it in motion. You're like, oh no, no, it does work for the universe they're doing. I had heard that Thor Ragnarok is like the Hell version. And watching the trailer, I didn't get a sense of, a sense of Hell, although uh, that Hela is in it, and you know she's running Valhalla, like you were saying, Schnepp. But I didn't get that. Oh, hell is invading. I really got that gladiator vibe. Mm, you know, it's yeah. just like, oh, he, he's Maximus and he's in gladiator and he has to fight Hulk, which is great. And then, because uh, you know that fight's going to be the greatest throwdown in Marvel, possibly, possibly mm. ever. You know, so the trailer did what it needed to do. It brought life to the images that I was kind of on the fence about. And I was like, oh, no, totally. Right. It reminds me of. Far Cry Blood Dragon, how it's like purposely kind of old school looking, you know, if you look at the title, Thor Ragnarok, Total. look at the title for Far Cry Blood Dragon, same thing. I was going to say, like, those sound like four random words, but I'm guessing it's a video game. It is. There we go. <laughs> it, is, it is a good video game. Now, I, I feel bad for poor Wendy over there because she's uh, she hasn't watched it yet, so she's going to react to it a little bit later on today. Sorry, Wendy. We're going to keep you silent on this phase, but Ashley, did you get a chance to check out the Thor Ragnarok trailer? Yeah, I was trailer? trying to watch it on low so that Wendy couldn't really hear it. I had but, earmuffs. Um, she had earmuffs, but nothing can wake me up on a Monday morning like Tom Hiddleston as Loki. Man, that man is sexy. Um, I love seeing Tessa Thompson in, in this as Valkyrie. She's a great actress, and I don't feel like she gets the credit she kind of deserves, so I really like seeing her in this. And Hella looked so bomb. That contour, though, the way she handled that hammer, get uh, it, girl. I'm really excited for it. Yeah, no. Hella really looked like Maleficent's older, tougher sister. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> is, it, is it weird that Justice League and Thor are both using Led Zeppelin songs? They're both, both coming out in... Uh, November. I think it's awesome, and I think look, it was cool when Logan had Johnny Cash's Hurt in there, and that's a slower song, and when A Cure for Wellness had a very slow down different version of the Ramones, mm. but my God, sometimes the original is just what you need to play, and that's what we got with Immigrant Song. Mm. I thought it was the perfect mm -hmm. announcement because there's a lot of Norse godlike references in that tune anyway. They're coming from the land of the ice and snow, and it's a, another mission that Thor, even himself, has never seen before, so I'm very excited about this trailer. We want to hear from you guys. Comment right now in the live chat or on YouTube after the fact. Ashley, what's our first official topic of the day? In an interview with Confidential via the New York Daily News, Carrie Fisher's brother, Todd Fisher, confirmed she will make an appearance in the final Star Wars movie of the new trilogy. Todd revealed that Disney bosses wanted to bring back General Leia for Episode 9, so both he and Carrie's daughter, Billy Lord, granted the studio rights to use unused footage from Episode 7 and 8. Todd also clarified that the use of CGI will not be used to recreate Leia. Leia. To what extent Leia will figure into the storyline is unclear at this time, with Todd saying, I'm not the only part in that equation, but I think the people deserve to have her. You don't mess with this legacy. It would be like rewriting the Bible. To me, Star Wars is the holy grail of storytelling and lore, and you can't mess with it. Perry, thoughts on using unused footage to bring back General Leia in Episode Nine? In Disney, Lucasfilm, and the filmmakers I trust. So if they think this is the right approach, that's fine by me. I'm kind of not one to judge because I don't know what the story <laughs> is for episode eight or episode nine. But as a huge fan of Carrie Fisher and as someone who respects her legacy and the legacy of that character in the franchise, I guess I can suppose that this is the right way to go about it. It's a very touchy topic. We obviously have limited, we have cut out the possibility of recreating her digitally, which I think is very appropriate, but still you're left in the position where you need to figure out how to appropriately wrap up that character's run in the series where it both serves her legacy and is respectful, but also serves the story they need to tell because the series needs to continue. So if they have the footage 
that can make it work, where they can potentially manipulate the stories in episode eight and episode nine to make it work and give her character a satisfying conclusion, I am totally behind this. Yeah, and Lucasfilm seems to really have her best interest in mind and her estate's best interest. So if you're using footage that has already been shot that she did for another scene, whether it's episode seven or episode eight, I would have to assume, and I would hope like you, Perry, that we're putting our faith in them because it's going to serve the story well and we're not going to feel weird or it's not going to be too jarring. It's going to be able to fit in with the story that they want to tell. And Jeremy, even when we saw Rogue One, Gareth Edwards being able to go back and look at footage from the original New Hope that was not used. So he got to go in there and look at some of the Rebel pilots. Now again, that's a Rebel pilot that we cheered when we saw them, mm -hmm. and they had maybe a different line, so it wasn't too much in the way of actually serving the story, but I thought it was a nice nugget in Rogue One, and if they go further down that path with somebody as crucial as General Leia, do you think that's the right play? Yeah, I think... Uh... Uh, I mean, they did that in Gladiator. It's funny. It was the second Gladiator yeah. reference you get. But that uh, the guy... Oliver who, Reed. Yeah, he had died before Gladiator was done. Mm. So they took some of his uh, moments here and shuffled them to there. And I mean, superimposed. And that was like 15 years ago, 16 right. years ago. Was it 17 years ago? Uh. All right. Well, I'm old. And that's just all you <laughs> need to know. But the point is they did it. And so I, I feel like if there's enough to give her that resolution and conclusion, that's great. This was only a couple scenes they had with this dude. I don't know how much Leia we're going to get. But if they made a Leia-centric story, which probably has to do with her kid, I, I would like to see resolution rather than like, yeah, Leia's somewhere else on this other world, so let's continue the adventure. That is the wrong way to go about it. You don't ride her out in the opening crawl or anything like that. You have to do what you have to do. I think uh, using some of the old footage to finish up her story is the right call. And personally, if I can say it personal, I've been looking forward to a Bible special edition rewrite for a very long time. Look for <laughs> Centaur's Luke and a Master Sword. That's all I want in Bible EX special edition alpha. See a lot of books in the Septuagint. Mm. We're just going to Keep expanding right. them, man. It's going to be a big Bible when it's the King Jeremy version. Now, Schnepp, when we look at the, the landscape of the new trilogy, it seems like a lot of it is going to be the Kylo Ren arc, and the way to close that potentially could be a redemption of that character right. with his mother, but now it's going to be very tough to do that. Do you think that there's too much pressure on the Carrie Fisher or the General Leia character that we're going to be so expecting something, and that actually is going to hamper their ability to use footage in episode nine? I don't think so. I think, I mean, to me, when Kylo Ren, spoilers if you haven't seen Force Awakens, <laughs> when he kills his father, uh, that redemption went out the door. I mean, for I, me, it did. Yeah, for me, I, I see no redemption for Kylo Ren other than his death, because that's, you just don't do that to Han Solo. So, um, I, when, Unfortunately, when I first heard about Carrie's death, I was really bummed out. Once I started thinking about after, you know, her and her mom's death right after. I mean, mm -hmm. it was so tragic and horrible. Later in the, later in the, after, you know, after that month of ugliness, I was like, well, I wonder what they're going to do with, uh, with uh, Star Wars. And it makes sense to think about, well, they've already shot. And I heard that episode eight had a lot of Carrie-centric stuff in it. It would make sense that they move some of those scenes over to episode nine and do what kind of they possibly did with Oliver Reed and also Brandon, Brandon Lee in The Crow and reconstitute and refigure some situations and scenes around. And, and I think that they're, that's what they're doing. They're, they're figuring it out and they're using some of the footage that was shot for episode eight and moving that over to episode nine, which that to me makes the most sense. Like if she had like eight scenes in episode eight, now she's got five and they're moving three of them over to episode nine and refiguring out that story element for episode nine because it gives them a little bit more time. Yeah, and it's nice to hear from her brother and her daughter on this issue as well, because it's one thing if it's a movie studio saying, we're going to use this footage and put it in here, but hearing that it's her estate's wishes and that it's probably what Carrie Fisher would have wanted puts me at ease. And like Perry said, I have faith in Lucasfilm to do the right thing in telling their story. If she can be in service of that, I think we're all going to be very satisfied. And it's a fitting legacy at the end of the day. All right, Ashley, what's our next topic? THR reports that Dwayne The Rock Johnson has closed a deal to star in Jungle Cruise, Disney's live-action adaptation of its theme park ride. The report <laughs> states Johnson has found a spot in his busy schedule to shoot the film, slotting the movie for a spring 2018 start of production. Jungle Cruise is one of Disneyland's original rides, taking park goers on a journey through a range of settings, like the African Nile and Congo Rivers, as well as South America's Amazon. Johnson has been attached to the project since 2015 and now with a new draft turned in and ready Johnson made room in his schedule to begin work. A release date has 
hasn't been determined. Schnepp, thoughts on a Jungle Cruise movie with The Rock? Well... <laughs> honestly uh, yeah when, when it was first announced i was like so what? based on a ride pirates oh wait a minute maybe and then i forgot about it and then he's been in all these other movies black adam he's like he's booked for like 400 years or something in all these other <laughs> movies but i really can't rip on it too much because i actually kind of enjoyed san andreas and that's like a stupid earthquake disaster movie but the rock made it fun to watch and Riley was telling me, it's like, oh, it's some advanced word. Somebody said on Twitter, it's like, I heard it's like Raiders of the Lost Ark meets the African Queen. The African Queen's an old movie. Check it out. Watch it. It's black and white. I know. Stop crying about it. Um, <laughs> look, if that's how, if it's Raiders of the Lost Ark meets African Queen with the rocket, and he was like, what are you in our script meetings? I was like, all of a sudden, I'm a little bit more excited about it. So I'm going to be interested in seeing it now. I mean, isn't this the easiest movie for The Rock to shoot because he can just do it when he's not filming Jumanji? Like, you're already in the jungle. You can make two movies <laughs> at the same exact time with a different crew and a different cast. It wouldn't shock me if Kevin Hart actually turns up in this thing, but The Rock has such a good relationship with Disney. He had, clearly, he had a blast uh, promoting Moana and doing the voice work for that. So if he gets to be in another Disney adventure, you know that they want to make movies based on rides and vice versa. Now, Jeremy, you have interesting thoughts both about this movie and the ride itself at Disney World. <laughs> well, the, the, the dad joke river? That's what it is. I, was, I saw this, I was like, they're not making a ride about the dad joke river. If you guys have never been on, the, on what I call the dad joke river, it's all dad jokes all the time. Like little piranhas, like, ooh, piranhas, keep your hands out of the water. This ride really bites. Ooh, over there, they're doing arts and crafts. Art's at the top, and it shows these like cannibals trying to get this. It's like... It is. Excuse me, is that a spotted tiger over there? Yeah. Oh, no, <laughs> Schnepp. It's not. Tiger, tigers aren't spotted. They're striped. Oh. It's that for 15 minutes. That's actually how it's going to happen. So we're going to be on a cruise, and they're going to be like, it's getting bumpy. It looks like we're going to hit a big rock. And then he's going to pop out of the water just like oh. that. That's his intro. Done. However, if they are making it like a modern-day Indiana Jones, because I, I remember the rundown, and I really enjoyed that, mm -hmm. too. If it's something in the vein of that, could be fun, but at that point, why even call it? What's it called? The Dad Joke River? It's not called that. It's Jungle, Jungle Cruise. Cruise. Right. Jungle Dad Joke River. Don't. I mean, at that point, it's just marketing the title so more people associate it with that and go into the movie. But it probably, hopefully, won't be too much like that. There's probably going to be that one person that makes dad jokes the entire time, and Rock <laughs> is going to punch him. It's going to be great. <laughs> But it has potential to be good. Perry, because you're here at the Collider offices so frequently, you hear a lot of dad jokes and even some really <laughs> funny uncle jokes during the course of your day. Are you excited for a movie version of the Dad Joke River? Dad jokes, fart noises, I get the best of it here. <laughs> I, well, I actually think the dad joke thing could kind of work because I look, I mean, I look at this image, which clearly is an official image for this movie, but I think of The Rock and a Jungle Cruise movie that's kind of like Indiana Jones, if that is the case. And I do see some sort of Kevin Hart type character spitting out right. dad jokes right. and him getting ready to punch him in the face. So that kind of makes sense. It seems weird still to adapt a ride to a movie, even though you said the same thing about pirates and that took off and it's great. Not really. Some of them are great. But this one, I've never been on the ride. I was reading oh, up on the ride. Uh, clearly, I'm missing out on all the wonderful dad jokes in my life. But... I was reading up on the ride, and I guess the one potentially good thing about adapting a ride to a movie versus another piece of material is that at least they're not boxed into a very specific story. I mean, it seems to me like all the different jungle cruises around the world, it's more about just exploring a new area. And that, to me, seems like it could be a good idea for a franchise, which I'm sure is what he's thinking, is that each time you go in a different, a different part of the world and you go down the jungle and you, you, know, you fight hippos and you see elephants and there's cannibals and all these crazy things going around. So I think it's a, a pretty appropriate movie for someone like Dwayne Johnson. The craziest thing to me about this story is when they break down his schedule. He begins shooting Rampage later this spring, right. then Skyscraper in late summer and fall, Jumanji opens in December, and then Jungle Cruise will be shot next. I'm sorry, but if anybody out there ever doubted The Rock, Wow, this guy works hard. No, when I see his schedule, I need a nap. I mean, yeah. the guy works so hard, and it just seems like there's just a never-ending well of support from us fans about movies that he's opening. So until that runs out, keep making as many franchises as you possibly can. He seems to enjoy it, and we enjoy watching him. Ashley, uh, I know that you've been on the Jungle Cruise a number of times. You're a big fan of Disneyland, as are you, Wendy. Is this the right ride to make a film based on? You guys are being so nice about this. This sounds 
horrible. Haters this corner. Is Haters corner. Haters corner. Terrible. This is the worst ride at Disneyland, and you're going to make a movie about it. The wait time is always so long, and the whole time I'm just thinking, when can I go on Splash Mountain? And it's like, what, a five-minute ride? I can't imagine an hour and a half of the Jungle Cruise. It sounds terrible. Ashley, you just I, I'm writing a script called Splash Mountain. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> See, That's now, it. Wendy, if there, was, if there was one movie or one ride at Disneyland that you would assume the rock... Now, look, the rock could open teacups to $60 million. That's mm -hmm. not a hard thing for him. But I would assume Splash Mountain would be the movie right, you that would The Rock think. would be on. Is that you, Wendy? I mean, I would think more like Thunder Mountain. Matterhorn. 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 Oh, Matterhorn. Ooh. Ooh. Okay, no, so but I actually, you know, I'm not completely selling this idea of The Rock being in the Jungle Cruise <laughs> movie. Sorry, Hova. <laughs> okay. no. Haters Street, alone. Haters Corner, they're breaking up. <laughs> haters Corner, divided. I just think that with his personality and his track record with, like, fun movies, with even with the dad jokes, I just think that he can make this work. And The Jungle Cruise is kind of that, like, niche ride where you go on, like, if Indiana Jones is too long and you're like hey 15 minutes is right next door dad joke time and uh you know you just kind of go and make fun of the the little animatronics and the <laughs> <laughs> i don't know what animal does this but i know i want, I want to I see wish. that animal it's kind of like a really yeah. friendly hippo yeah. until you get too close because hippos yeah. are the most dangerous do you creature. know i'm a story, spotted tiger there was a skipper on his last day of work you know how they have the the little pop-pop guns yeah. shot at the uh, hippo and then they're like, it's not dead, guys. Everyone watch for yourself. Dove into the water, took a knife and like ripped it apart. And when now was he's, this? Now he's like blacklisted. That's amazing. Oh. I would do that. Disney property. Okay. Um, if I that is the post credit scene in Jungle Cruise, <laughs> I'm totally going to see it. I have an inkling that it's probably going to be a much more family friendly. This is going to feel like Journey to the Center or Journey to the Center. Whatever The Rock did with Selena Gomez, I think it's going to be more in that vein than anything else, but still probably going to be a nice family ride and it's going to make gobs of money. Speaking of making money, what did so at the box office this weekend, Ashley? Was it babies or was it Smurfs? <laughs> and we're about to find out. It's mm. Monday, which means it's time for the weekend box office report. Fox and DreamWorks' The Boss Baby took mm. the number one spot at the box office for a second mm. weekend in a row, pulling in an estimated $26.3 million, and its domestic total now inching towards $90 million after just 10 days in release. In the number two spot was Disney's Beauty and the Beast, pulling in $25 million as its domestic total tops $430 million. It added another 36.1 million internationally for a worldwide total over 975 million. New release Smurfs, The Lost Village barely met expectations, landing in the number three spot with an estimated 14 million, while another new release, New Line's comedy remake going in style, took the number four spot with an estimated 12.5 million. And rounding out the top five was Paramount's Ghost in the Shell. The movie dropped over 60% for an estimated 7.2 million. Jeremy, thoughts on the box? Baby being the number one at the box office for a second weekend in a row. <clears throat> Gonna be honest, couldn't have called it. But <laughs> if I, if ever there was a good weekend for me to go back up north and visit the visit the family in Washington and kind of miss out on movies to review in any given weekend, it looks like last weekend was the weekend <laughs> to do it. I chose right. Boss Baby being number one second weekend in a row, making what twenty six million. Couldn't, I no idea. Uh, Beauty and the Beast, it looks like it's going to hit a billion. I'm actually happy to see that. The Smurfs was the one I thought would have been number one. Apparently, no one cares about Smurfs. I don't care about Smurfs. It looks like the, the catch the fourth installment on uh, direct to Blu-ray or <laughs> DVD or whatever streaming service you watch. Going in Style, I wanted to see. I don't know how it's been received with the tomato. Made. Did you see Going in Style? I did Mark? not see Going in Style. All right. I so. did see Smurfs. Oh, well, well, you know what? Mark with the good decision making. But Zach Braff directed <laughs> Going in Style, and I like Garden State, so I was interested in seeing it. But I, I, I have been on internets over there and uh, visiting over here. Uh, Ghost in the Shell, happy to see it uh, getting killed because I didn't care about it. And, you know, if you want to adapt and make it good, you know, like you have to make it good and see so the fact that it's down to 7.35 million, it is what it is. It probably would be making more if it were better. Yeah, as visually stunning as the trailer has looked, once Ghost in the Shell came out, I still haven't seen it, and I don't know that I will at this point. I was interested in going in style because it looked fun. I liked the stars in it, like a like, like a Last Vegas meets Tower yeah. Heist, so a little bit of Ocean's Eleven thrown in there. Could be fun. And I did see Smurfs, The Lost Village, A, because I had to review it, and B, because 
it at least was the Smurfs in an animated world right. for the entire movie. They're not running into Doogie Howser halfway through on the streets of New York, which just felt so out of place. The bummer about it is if they had done that with the first Smurfs movie, I think that it would have crushed. I think that it would have been a great franchise. And now because they shot themselves in the foot twice, they have this new one come out, and you can throw Julia Roberts in there. You can throw a fun adventure in a new village, and it's just not going to hit well because we're so – there's a stigma against Smurfs now, Perry. People do not want to go see Smurfs anymore, and that was proven because Boss Baby, for the second week, number one, that's shocking to me. Cookies are indeed for closers, and all you babies deserve a cookie. I can't believe I'm actually going to have to go see that movie now. I don't want to say have to, but the fact that it's doing so well mm – -hmm. It kind of mm. makes me curious. I feel like I should see it. If everyone's loving it and it's crushing it at the box office and making so much money, I don't know. I kind of do want to see it now. Um, otherwise, this is kind of how I expected it to go. I didn't think Smurfs was going to do very well. And even though that movie does have big, big A-list name talent on the voice <laughs> roster like Julia Roberts, I certainly haven't seen her promote that movie all that much. I think the only thing I heard about her promoting Smurfs was someone who mentioned that she was in a featurette, and she looked very unhappy in that featurette doing the <laughs> voice work for the movie. So I don't think that was going to get it anywhere, but... Oh, I see Riley cheering over there. I guess Riley told me about that. Thank mm. you, Riley. Uh, the, the one bummer that I keep looking at, surprise, surprise, is Power Rangers. It's just slipping away. Not it's really. number six. That's not a bummer. I know, but I, re I really thought, because I was holding on really tight to the fact that it had a super high cinema score, and normally that means that a movie has more legs, and it kind of didn't. But then again, there's still some overseas markets that it hasn't hit, so I'm kind of waiting for it to open there, and you know, maybe it'll wind up being that international sensation, and that will help it cruise along to its second movie. Should have as someone who loves smurfing himself multiple times a day, nobody <laughs> smurfed oh. this weekend, or at least there wasn't as much smurfing as people thought. Well, I smurfed just this morning. It was it was pretty awesome, and I refuse to see this stupid Smurfs movie, so I don't care about it. You know what? Don't see Ghost in the Shell. See Blade Runner, Mark. Okay. I still <laughs> see, need to see Blade Runner. Actually, see a good movie, because I'm, I'm happy to see Ghost in the Shell, this live-action version, tanking, because it was such a bummer to me. Yes, it's visually cool-looking. Everything else about it is a big failure, at least in my opinion. I mean, some people might have liked it. Uh, I thought it was a failure on multiple fronts. Uh, all the other films, I'm not going to see, you know, Boss Baby. I don't care if it's number one for the rest of the year. <laughs> I do love the, 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 the cookies are for closers. Things made me giggle. Christian saw it with his daughter and said it was, you know, she enjoyed it and he got some giggles out of it, which is more than I can say for Smurfs because Smurfs, I think they attempt one joke aimed at people over eight years old and it doesn't land. And for the rest of the movie, Smurfs are like, all right, we're not doing that crap again. So. <laughs> you know, there, there are notes to be taken, though. That's, the point is do not bring the snorks to New York if you want them to survive <laughs> by the third installment because it's just not going to work you out. You know, Jeremy, you can talk all the junk you want about dad jokes but at least dads are trying to make jokes at least dads are out there <laughs> trying to be funny well we go from the box office report to box office tracking which is always so reliable isn't that right ashley <laughs> the release of wonder <laughs> woman is a little under two months away and now box office analysts are paying close attention to the next installment of the dc expanded universe box office pro is reporting that wonder woman is currently tracking to have the lowest opening of any movie in the dc expanded universe with 83 million predicted for the first female-led superhero movie this would put it well behind opening weekends of man of steel's 160 16 million, Suicide Squad's 133 million, and Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice's 166 million. Mark, buy or sell Wonder Woman's box office tracking. Ash, I'm a big fan of you. I enjoy your personality. I consider us friends. Why are you wasting my time with this? I don't <laughs> oh care gosh. about tracking at all. <laughs> tracking means absolutely nothing to me. I am so tired of tracking, Schnepp. Harry, Jeremy, they keep saying, oh, well, it's not tracking. Oh, it's not tracking. Well, Beauty and the Beast, around this time before its release, was tracking like $115 million. It ended up doing a little bit better than that. I do not trust tracking. There's so many different modern ways that you can buy tickets that tracking has not caught up to yet, so I do not care about box office tracking. I love numbers. I love stats. I'm a big baseball fan. I do not care about box office tracking. Jeremy, hit me. <laughs> this sounds like the words of a man who thought Beauty and the Beast was going to make $200 million to the box closer than people thought. <laughs> uh, no, but I, I'm with you, though. I've seen so many times where the tracking was good. It didn't do so well. Tracking was low. It really, it really went high. And sometimes the tracking is kind of right on. I don't care. Um, I, and also, it, it sounds like they're comparing Wonder Woman to, like, look, it's not tracking quite as high as the movie where Batman and Superman fought. 
<laughs> I don't know that it's actually going to... It's like Batman and Superman fought. Yeah. Nothing's going to track well, like that well in this universe. I think Wonder Woman's going to do... I mean, I think it's going to do good numbers, going to do good money. I mean, if it's good, I mean, I'd want to see it get ghost in the shell and just mm. kind of go away after mm. one weekend. You know, I want the movie to be good. I want it to thrive. I want people who are you know, either on the fringe or in the negative spectrum of the DC universe to look at it and be like, hey, maybe there's something there. You know, I feel like this is the movie that a lot rides on Wonder Woman, uh, but whether or not it's tracking as well as Batman versus Superman, uh, the, 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 go smurf yourself. I don't care. Yeah, I want the movie to be great, Perry, and I also want people to go see it, not just people who are big fans of the DCU, which some sentiment for that may be sliding a little bit because the last movies haven't been critically received all that well, but with Wonder Woman, that opens up a whole new world of possibilities, so I would expect it to do pretty well at the box office. Well, $83 million opening weekend, if it does wind up meeting the ex these expectations, that's doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. I mean, folks that are running that crazy headline where, oh my God, Wonder Woman's going to be the lowest opener of all the DCEU movies. I mean, really put that into context because 83 million is not a low opening. And, you know, I was just going back and trying to see what kind of predictions this outlet made. And it's not like I could say, oh, they're always wrong. They're always low. Don't worry. This is going to wind up crushing it because... You know, one of, one of the ones that's a good example, actually, is Suicide Squad. This outlet for their long-range forecast predicted $98 million. Movie wound up making $133 million opening weekend. Could you imagine if that happens here? And then right then and there, Wonder Woman is up with the other movies. But we're still so far away. There's so many things that need to happen. There is no way that Wonder, the Wonder Woman promotional campaign is in high gear right now. Just imagine when we get closer and you're not going to be able to like turn any which way without seeing something Wonder Woman related. Plus, word of mouth is going to be huge. There's just so many factors that are going to come into play. I love me some box office predictions. You all know that. And I do have fun playing this game too. Mm. To a point, and that's what you have to do is you got to go and you got to compare and you got to use all these analytics and make the best guess you possibly can. Things change as you go up, as you go up to the release. So just don't take this to heart right now and don't take these headlines to heart because this doesn't necessarily mean anything. And what it comes down to is even if it is 83 million, that's a lot of money. Schnapp, I uh, run hot and cold when it comes to box office. You clearly are the oracle of 2015. Do you <laughs> think that this is going to do over $100 million? I would think it has to. You know what? Tracking went out when they threw away the VHS. I don't even <laughs> refer to tracking unless it's some kind of static at the top of my head. Screw tracking. You guys are idiots, you trackers. None of the trackers have been right. Over this whole last year, everybody's tracking shit wrong. I, I'm sick of talking about tracking because none of it's right. I think Wonder Woman will break $100 million easily. And even if it made $80 million, that's a hell of a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So they're like, you're right. They're comparing it to Batman v Superman. They're comparing it to Suicide Squad. These movies that had a lot of hype and super high expectations around them. Guess what else has high expectations around it? Wonder Woman. So maybe the tracking isn't that high just right now. It's going to only increase every week. Trackers. I don't know. I mean, who are these? Are they like the Nielsen's? We're the trackers. They should make a TV show about the trackers and then they all die. Well, in the same way that once you had the advent of DVR and TiVo and stuff like that, it gets harder to know just exactly how many people are watching a TV show at any given time. Right. I think that with all these different apps, you can purchase tickets on, you can pre buy tickets, going to the theater, getting two for ones, all that kind of stuff. It really makes it hard to factor in how much a movie is going to make opening weekend until so you actually see the results and the results for what they're worth. I think maybe the best comic book. Uh, film as far as the uh, critical reviews maybe all year was Logan that made $88 million opening weekend and right. now it's almost at $220 million so an opening weekend does not make or break a movie if it gets a good critical response if it gets a good fan response it can keep on chugling week after week after week hopefully that's the case with Wonder Woman now Ashley I got a little heated and I got a little mad at you okay so I'm just are you hoping sorry now that I, I, it, maybe you can give me a good story to assage what we just had to go through I'll try okay in the upcoming adaptation of Meg, Jason Statham will be pitted against a gigantic prehistoric yes! shark known <laughs> as the Megalodon. Woo! Based on the book of the same name, it will be helmed by National Treasure and the Sorcerer's Apprentice director, John Turtletop. During a recent appearance on the Jim and Sam show, Statham offered up a new description as to what we can expect from the movie. I just did a movie about a shark. It's a cross between, I'd say, Jaws and Jurassic Park. It turned out really good. I mean, apparently. We don't know until we see it. It's called Meg, as in Megalodon. Perry, buy or sell the description of Meg by Jason Statham. Oh. 
<laughs> Thanks for distracting me, Jeremy. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I, hashtag pair me. Pair me. Pair oh, me. here pair we go me. again. Thanks, guys. Um, I'm a big fan of this book that this movie is based on. And the way that Jason Statham describes it is exactly how the book reads. I mean, Mark Riley even told me that the book that he had said this on the cover. So this is a very appropriate description of Meg the book. The only thing that has been throwing me off since hearing that the movie is going to get made is that... One, Jason Statham is not who I pictured in this lead role. In the book, the lead role is very much like, a, he reminds me of Alan Grant a little. He's very much into the science. And even though the book is this like batshit crazy scenario where a giant shark comes, comes out of nowhere and wrecks stuff, it still is based in enough science that it feels real and scary, kind of like in Jurassic Park when they say, oh, we can collect dino DNA, DNA and make dinosaurs. But then they put Jason Statham in it, and I start to picture things like, like this. And then you say John Turtletaub is directing it, and all of a sudden it takes away the horror of it versus, let's say, an Eli Roth. Then again, Eli Roth dips too much into the horror genre than what I thought while reading this book. But I just really hope this turns out to be a good movie. It sounds, it sounds like a fun, exciting package. And when I, when I saw the first image of, um, of Jason Statham on set, dressed in character, standing next to the actress who plays Terry, I can't remember her name, they, the way he was dressed, they do look like the character. Something about Jason Statham just like standing there on a boat in a turtleneck rather than being, I don't know, like all rough and tough and crazy. That made me think, okay, that might be the Jonas that I read in the book. So I, I hope it does. I hope it sticks to the source material just because I loved it so much. All right, Dewey Decimal. I'm going to step out of the library for a minute, and I'm just going to say Jason Statham versus the giant shark, Jurassic Park, and Jaws. What's not this movie's tracking at four hundred million dollars opening weekend? It's going to be fantastic. I have nothing but good things to say about whether it becomes the greatest movie of all time or one of the dumbest sci-fi Sharknado experiences ever. Jason Statham versus a giant shark. I watched Jaws last night. Jeremy, I am high on sharks, and I've never been more excited about it. How you feeling, buddy? I, I, uh, I if it's supposed to be a scientist, I totally get. It. I feel like Statham will be like, I've seen the entire series of Breaking Bad. <laughs> Jurassic Shark. That's what I'm going to call this. I'm going to call this Jurassic Shark. And I think that yeah. it could be a great thing. It could be complete garbage. But if they no. play up what it is and what it sounds like anyway, it could be a lot of fun. <laughs> I hope it's fun because Jason Statham taking on a shark just sounds absurd. Jurassic Shark coming at you. Tracking at 400 million. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the, the dumb popcorn fun that Jeremy and I hope to have with the, the, the literary experience that Perry hopes to have, we all have huge expectations. I love how you're calling me a nerd when I picked up a book about a giant shark. Relax. I'm not, I never, <laughs> did, the, the, that never came out of my mouth. I just think that you're looking at it from one approach. I'm looking at it from a different, dumber approach. But either way, we're very excited about this movie. That's if there's one person on the panel that can bring us down to earth and talk some sense into <laughs> It's John Schnapp. Let me tell you something, sweaties. <laughs> this, this has a lot of flavor. This has so much flavor going on. Everybody's going to get so much flavor, so much sweaty. I buy this. I buy everything about this. Giant shark, sweaty. Jason Statham, sweaty. That other person, sweaty. I, the $400 million opening? Try $500 million, my friend. I buy this. I buy this so hard. This book, hi everybody, uh, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> this book, Meg, I'm telling you what, right now, Giant Shark, I cannot wait for this movie. I'm with you, I'm with you, I've read this book, I'm going to read the second one, I'm going to read the third one, I'm going to read the new one that's a Hell's Aquarium with this dig, where they capture all the Megalodons. This thing has franchise potential and I can't wait. God, I love when John <laughs> Schnepp is on the show. All right, well, you heard it here. John Schnepp, huge buy for the new Jason Statham movie, Just Meg. Ashley, what's our next Monday. story? While guesting on MTV's Josh Horowitz's Happy, Sad, Confused podcast to talk about his role in Smurfs The Lost Village, Joe Manganiello revealed that he has co-written a draft of a new Dungeons & Dragons movie with his Carnegie Mellon friend, John Cassell. Speaking about the project, Manganiello compared his draft of the script to Game of Thrones and Fellowship of the Ring, and then later revealed on Twitter that his version of the movie will be based on Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman's 1984 fantasy novel, Dragons of Autumn Twilight. The first 
Dragonlance novel. There is still no word on if the project will be moving forward at this time. Jeremy, buy or sell a Dungeons and Dragons movie with Joe Manganiello. You know, people got to stop comparing fantasy things to Lord of the Rings. So what was the last one? It was Warcraft. They were like, we're going to make Lord of the Rings and it's going to be, and it wasn't really like that. I have to sell this just out of, I didn't know he could, <laughs> did he, does he write scripts or was he like, I'm just going to write one today. Why not? And uh, the stigma of the, the first Dungeons and Dragons movie is still around. And anytime it's, it's, you could get, you could get the most talented script writer on the face of the planet, whoever you think that person is to pen a Dungeons and Dragons script, I will still sell it because I'm like, I have to see to believe. And that's the only way I'm going to buy a Dungeons and Dragons movie until then the first one happened. And it still haunts me to this day. I'm going to buy because it's an easy way to word the question. Do I buy or sell a Dungeons and Dragons movie with Joe Manganiello? Now, that doesn't mean that it has to be his script that we're making the movie. I just got to buy that dude in a Dungeons and Dragons movie at some point in the future. And I'm going to buy that because, yes, there is a huge stigma associated with the first Dungeons and Dragons. And a lot like the Warcraft movie, there's a hurdle you have to get over where you not only have to capture the hardcore fan base, which does exist of Dungeons and Dragons, but you also want to expand it to the general populace and get them excited which is why you throw in a Game of Thrones flavor in there. So I think you will eventually have another shot at Dungeons & Dragons, and I would welcome Joe Manganiello participating in that, whether he's writing it or just being in front of the camera. What's say you, Schnepp? I'm going to buy it just because I didn't know Joe Manganiello was such a nerd. I love the idea that he's like, I'm playing Dungeons & Dragons with my friends, and I I'm going to make a movie. <laughs> Screw Deathstroke. Dungeons & Dragons. <laughs> and that's exactly how Manganiello talks when he's not on screen. I'm talking like this. I'm rolling a 20. Uh... <laughs> I'm buying that. You know, he's he's dropping Game of Thrones, dropping all these you know names. You're right, Jeremy. Whenever they say it's going to be like all of these really popular, famous, and well-written things, it's like just say it's going to be a good Dungeons and Dragons, and you're going to get every nerd behind you, even with that shitty first Dungeons Ugh. and Dragons movie with Jeremy Irons, like <laughs> you know, screaming, Ugh. horrible film. But you play Dungeons and Dragons, you're like, look, there is a Dungeons and Dragons movie. In fact, Dungeons and Dragons movies that are waiting to be made. So I, anytime somebody is 100% behind it, you can tell he's a sweaty, I'm into it. Perry, have you ever rolled a 52-sided die and do you buy this story? I haven't, but I'm looking for an excuse to play. I remember when I went on the set of The uh, the Last Witch Hunter, Vin, Vin Diesel mm -hmm. was obviously there, and he's a huge Dungeons & Dragons fan, and the way he was talking about it made me want to finally Collider, try. Collider Dungeons & Dragons is coming Behind the scenes. In June. Behind no, we're going to play a game. And we'll we're do gonna it. Get, we're going to get a game on. We might even do a mini series. I'm if someone has right a lot now. of patience to teach me everything. Look, we'll do a weekend. We'll record it. You're going to get to see some episodes. It's happening. Uh, yeah. That's going to be after <laughs> Collider Magic the Gathering, where Jerry and I once and for all settle who's the greatest when I use the deck that Jeremy loans. Bam. <laughs> but anyway, I buy this story strictly because. Joe Maganello, I watched a video where he sits there and plays, and you, you could just tell he's a fan. And yeah. if it's a fan that says they're you know super passionate and they want to make a good movie, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt, especially at this point when I think the quote was that it's in the very early stages. Who knows if this thing is going to happen? If he feels super passionate about it, good on him for giving it a shot. Totally. All right. Well, right now, over 8,000 of you are watching us live. And if you want to bellow from the Raptors and have your voices heard, we're going to give you the shot in just a couple of minutes. You guys can tweet us any question you want about movies, and we might read it on the air. Go ahead and hit us up right now at collider video and this is not the only show that airs on collider video on our youtube channel later on today we're going to have tv talk is dropping this afternoon and we also currently have up our rogue one commentary there was myself ken knapsack christian harloff and occasionally john campia it was a lot of fun to do campia was late but he stayed until the end and during a particular scene towards the end about nine other people came into the room and watched <laughs> it was a lot of fun to do and do not forget if you guys haven't already download the verizon go nine app on your phones right now and check out a new episode of Awesome Tack. You're starring that young man over there, Jeremy Johns, this Friday <laughs> and every Friday like it. Oh, and by the way, we're going to be at Star Wars Celebration this weekend, so we have a whole lot of festivities. We have a panel on Thursday. We have a panel on Friday. We will be doing a meetup Thursday night. It might not be the ideal time for everybody, but don't worry, because there's going to be a lot of opportunities to say hi to your favorite Collider personalities throughout the entire weekend. Cannot wait to say hi to all you guys. Oh, and by the way, I'll be at the Improv every night after Star Wars Celebration, right across the street. All right, now let's move on to Mailbag. This is the part of the show where we we answer an email that you guys wrote us. You guys can email us anytime, collidervideo at gmail.com. 
com and we'll answer it right here on Movie Talk or sometimes on our mailbag shows on the weekend. So Ashley, what is in our mailbox? Vishnu writes, Hi Collider Crew, greetings from the other side of the planet, India. Longtime fan since the AMC days. My question is, how many movies will be in Legendary's MonsterVerse? Will they stop it with King Kong vs. Godzilla or make individual movies about other popular monsters like Mothra and King Ghidra, or would they merge it with Pacific Rim Universe? I would like to hear your thoughts. Thanks. I want to see a lot of monsters in this monster verse, but the merging of Pacific Rim is where, Perry, I'm not sure if I draw the line or not. I'm really confused about that. I mean, Jeremy and I just got crazy over Jason Statham fighting a giant shark. I'd be remiss if I didn't kind of want to see Godzilla and King Kong be fighting each other and then like pull like a Batman v Superman and then see a bunch of Pacific Rim kaijas and be like, no, that's what we got to go after. So I kind of want to see that. I don't know if we're going to. No, I, I think I draw the line there. Okay. I, I think that would be too much and it just makes no sense. None at all. And also, I'm pretty sure that the studios behind Godzilla, King Kong, and all of that want to make their monster universe into a big thing. So right now, we've had 2014's Godzilla. We just had Kong Skull Island. Godzilla King of Monsters comes out in 2019. Godzilla vs. Kong comes out in May 2020. So four films. That's what we've got. I'm sure if those movies crush it, because I know Kong Skull Island is doing pretty damn well right now. I think it actually already passed the last Godzilla movie at the international box office. So if it keeps <laughs> going in that direction, they might add more to the slate. So right now four, but I think it could be more if it continues to do well. JJ, we're getting plenty of Godzilla and King Kong coming our way. Is there another monster that we need? Uh, yeah, how many monsters are there? My gosh, yeah, you already have Mothra, you have Rodan. Because everyone thought Rodan was in the original Godzilla when you saw that wing thing right. fall into the water. It's like, that's totally Rodan. It's a Muto. Right, it's not, but you're, we're going to get Rodan. If these movies, it, like you said, it, if they make money, we're going to see more. It's that simple. If they don't, we're going to see less. I do draw that. I, I don't think we need uh, Pacific Rim and uh, Godzilla monster crossover because it, it doesn't make sense. It's The Pacific Rim monsters were from some other dimension. Mentioned. They started out with the dinosaurs and throwing them in. These are some old monster mutations that we did with nuclear war, or may or may not. Maybe that's the old lore, not the new lore. The point is, they were already on Earth, it looks like. So uh, you don't need that, but that would be kind of neat. If two monsters are fighting and then you see Gypsy Danger just <laughs> pop down in there, and I'm like, that's why I named my dogs after you, I was going to say, I thought you meant your dogs, Gypsy and Danger. I, like, I love your dogs to death. Uh, it's going to be an uphill battle for them. You know what Danger would do is just throw the ball next to Godzilla and just like... <laughs> <laughs> like you don't, he, he you don't need like any Pacific Rim yeah, not in Godzilla all. or King Kong. You need Mecha Godzilla and Mecha Kong. That's what I'm talking about, son. They've already got sweet. this from the 70s. They have a giant robot version of Godzilla and a giant Kong. I'm not saying that I'd necessarily want to see that, but I don't think they're going to do a Rodan movie or a Ghidra movie because Rodan and Ghidra and Mothra are going to be in Godzilla King of Monsters. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, so those are the villains and those are the, you know, it's like Captain America has all of his friends in the Captain America movie. Godzilla is going to have all of his pals in his movie. Godzilla and King Kong, they are the main, you know, the main titles. They're going to fight in 2020, but that doesn't mean that there's not going to be another King Kong movie, especially with the, the amazing amount of money that Kong Skull Island made or Godzilla 3. So I, I think they're going to do Godzilla Kong, Godzilla Kong have all these other supplemental monsters show up until they figure out. I, I don't know about a Rodan separate or a Mothra standalone film. Yeah, know? I think you'll get plenty of screen time for the other monsters in the Godzilla universe. And if they can't fight the Pacific Rim monster somewhere down the road, Matt, maybe Jason Statham has somebody's number. Maybe we get Meg to fight Godzilla to fight King Kong. Who's with me? Let's march. Boo! I'm oh, nope. sorry. Yay. All right, then let's just move on to live Twitter <laughs> questions. Okay, Wendy, we announced we're going to take some live Twitter questions. Do we have some good ones here today? Well, I think so. This first one comes from Matthew Chantra, who writes, Hey, guys and gals. So tomorrow, Hamill and Ridley will be on Good Morning America and have a big reveal. What do you think it might be? I think that big reveal is probably going to be maybe like a tease for the teaser trailer that they're going to announce is going to drop on Friday when we get the Last Jedi panel. I think the wrong way to do this would be to just have the trailer drop on Good Morning America and then online at the same time. Now, would I watch it? You're damn right I would. But what everybody, including Star Wars, has been fond of, even when we had marketing for The Force Awakens, I remember they released like a 15-second clip on Instagram of John Boyega lighting up the blue mm -hmm. lightsaber. We all went crazy, and that was an indication that we might get some more footage soon. So I think they're obviously going to be promoting their appearances at Star Wars Celebration and saying that we have a lot to look forward to on Friday. And in the meantime, here's a quick little tease of something we can see. And now I'm going to watch Good Morning America tomorrow. That's mm. words I did not think would come out of my mouth today. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm not going to watch Good Morning America tomorrow. I'll wait till this whatever shows up on Good Morning America shows up on YouTube. Then I'm going to watch that. That's a good play, you cheater. I should probably have done that. Perry? Well, your point kind of just proves why they're doing this. I think it'd be a terrible idea to release the trailer, but if you do a trailer tease, you get a whole bunch of Star Wars fans watching Good Morning America, and when that's all under the same corporate umbrella as this film franchise... Smart play. You should do it. Just don't show the whole thing and ruin the excitement at Celebration. Right, but Jeremy, Mark Hamill, and Daisy Ridley, they're going to be at Celebration, and hopefully we get to see some of their live panels. But for people who are not going to be at Celebration, they might get some insight into their relationship off camera. Just, mm -hmm. hey, we got to film this That's incredible true. movie together, and I popped in right at the end. She handed me a lightsaber. That'll be fun to watch. I didn't even think about that, because I, I was with Schnepp. Like, okay, so when it drops online, or maybe it's bootlegged right. online, it doesn't even matter. I'll see it online, and I'll just check my Twitter feed until people <laughs> send me the link, and, you're, and Mark's over here like, yeah, but you get to see the chemistry between two actors. I'm like, well, God, that is important. All right, I guess I... I'll watch. Wait for that to drop online. Yeah. Also, I'll, 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 watch, watch. I'll watch that <laughs> also on YouTube. I'm not right. watching Good Morning America. You are coming over to my place. I am making cold pizza for breakfast. All right, four I'll be day there. old pizza. Can I dip co uh, hot coffee in it? If hey, if if you want to subscribe to Perry's ritual, yeah. have at Excuse it. Excuse me. It's You're a weird. Hey, look, it's a weird thing that Perry does. I just started she's the one that brought it up. She's adopted it. It yeah. stops right here. What's our next question, Wendy? <laughs> <laughs> Augustin Perez writes, after Ragnarok, which pair of characters would you like to see together? For me, it's Stark versus Strange, Ego Clash. Ooh, Ooh Tony nice. Stark versus Doctor Strange. That is a very mm. interesting clash. I mean, look, Thor and Hulk were so much fun because, like, what Jeremy and I were talking about earlier was almost like, like, you know, Martin Lawrence and Will Smith or Riggs and Murtar or, or just, like, great chemistry where they're also at odds with each other a little bit. So I think you would get that with a Tony Stark or Doctor Strange relationship. Any other ones you can think of, Schnepp? Boy, it's hard to tell because I know Spider-Man is in the Marvel uh, universe, mm -hmm. but only for a limited amount of time. I think it's like three standalone films and three you know, side movies. And he already did Civil War, and then he's in those two Avengers films. Or is he in just one Avengers film, and they're saving that final six one for something else? I don't know. But uh, we're kind of seeing a lot of the mashups that I've already wanted to see. I mean, we, we saw all those separate characters come together in Avengers. Now we're seeing Thor and Hulk. Uh, we've, we're going to see Doctor Strange also in Thor Ragnarok. Everybody's going to be hanging out and partying in Avengers Infinity War. So if any interactions that we haven't seen in Infinity War, by the time Infinity War and whatever the fourth Avengers happens, I don't know. It's hard to guess. So What do you got, Perry? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of with you. I think I'm seeing most of what I want, and I don't want too much, you know, butting heads, because we already had that in Civil War. We're going to get it a little here. So I don't really want to keep playing that same story over. But what I'm really looking forward to in Guardians is Nebula and Gamora. Oh. I mean, not, not necessarily saying that I think they're going to go head to head and be at odds the entire movie. But I am really excited to see how that relationship develops. I think Tony Stark's going to be the interesting one that you can pair with person X. Tony Stark and Bucky Barnes locked in a small room together. Just see what happens. <laughs> right. Just to see what happens if you've seen Civil War. I think Spoiler. that uh, this would never happen because it's two different universes technically, but I just want to see a road trip movie with Deadpool and Vision where they're just on the road together. <laughs> I think it'd be a really funny one and two that we'll never get because right. studios and legal and lawyers and all that crap. All right, Wendy, let's do one more Twitter question today. Okay, this one comes from Niles Healy who writes, The Pirates trailer, the words final adventure appears. Um, is it suggested that there will be more Pirates movie, or do you think this is the end? That's the way I take it. If you say it's the final adventure, I am going to assume that we're never getting another Pirates movie until the current Pirates movie I'm watching ends. And they're like, oh, you know what? No, we did fine. There actually is. We checked the stock room. There is 19 more adventures. This movie does well. There's no way it's going to be the final adventure for Pirates. They're going to say that. They're going to make us think, oh, man, this is the last time we get to do this in the theater, so we better pay money opening weekend. It's a lot like what Disney used to do when they would take like a class classic movie like Cinderella or 101 Dalmatians, and they say, hey, this movie's going to be available in stores for three weeks, and then it goes in the Disney mm. vault forever. <laughs> and you're like, oh, my God, I guess i got to rush out and see it. It's not forever. It's not the final adventure. And you guys see that differently. Uh, no, I, I mean, I took it as the final adventure until I was like money talks like we've talked about with the Godzilla monsters and everything right. else. I mean, Scream was going to be a trilogy. It was a trilogy. You give it 10 years, it might get another one. It may take a while, <laughs> but it will get another one. Jungle Cruise shared universe. What right. say you, Perry? Huh. 
Uh, yeah, I say money. Money. It's not going to be the final one. The, the final, desti final Destination film franchise pulled this one on me by calling the fourth movie the Final Destination. <laughs> right. I wish that was the only Final Destination movie that just didn't exist at all, but I've learned my lesson with franchises, and when you make a lot of money, they're going to keep going no matter what they say in trailers. Right. There is no final chapter. That's just what we know. Money <laughs> talks. Come on, come on. Love me for the money. And we love all of you guys for watching us each and every weekday right here on Collider Video's Movie Talk. I want to thank everybody behind the scenes. Adam is over there. You're the only one back there. Oh, no, nope. there's Cody. And then Riley is lurking around riding a giant shark somewhere in the studio <laughs> currently. I also want to thank my great panel full of panelists, starting with the one, the only Mr. Awesome Tacular himself, Jeremy Jones. Well, since you said Awesome Tacular, I will say you can watch my show Awesome Tacular on Go90. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of nerd. A lot a lot of great, a lot of movies, and more fun. You can find me at Jeremy Johns on YouTube, Twitter, rest of the internet. Be there, because sometimes I tweet nonsense that's, well, nonsense. <laughs> Is it off-putting when I call you Mr. Awesome Tacular when we go out to lunch and stuff, or no. would you prefer that? <laughs> no, I have that tattooed across my chest. <laughs> Mark <laughs> Ellis says Mr. Awesome Yeah, it Tacular. has the quote, Mr. Awesome Tacular, and then the quote, <laughs> Mark, yeah, Ellis Mark Ellis on the day. Yeah. Well, not quite as good of a nickname is Mrs. Bookworm. That would be Perry Aww. Nemiroff when you're not reading Aww. books based on giant sharks. <laughs> Where can wow, that makes you? me sound so, so lame. I Even though I love books. I don't think you're lame. Hey, if you I get think called you're a, a bookworm by, a dude, good, by a dude who I, doesn't read books, that's a compliment. It's more like audio bookworm. <laughs> Does that, is that yeah, that's different? Yeah, you can do I, that. I only listen. I don't like reading. Um, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram <laughs> at PNemeroff. Uh, we also have Collider Behind the Scenes that came out on Saturday. There is a beer pong episode we played. We had fun, and I think you should watch it. So go check it out. Yeah, when I'm not reading, I'm playing beer pong. So that's what I'm doing 99% <laughs> of the time. Mr. John, snap the Oracle. Where can the kids find you? You can find me fucking reading. Because reading is fundamental. I believe it's smurfing reading. Uh, yeah, you can find me smurfing. Um, I love to read. And don't ever let anybody say, don't read. Just punch them in the face. I never um, said don't read. God damn it, Mark. You should read my new comic, Slayer Number 2. It just came out at bookstores, comic book stores all across the planet. Buy it. Enjoy it. There's a lot of murder and death in it. And there's words involved. <laughs> I've read books before. You can also find me on Instagram and Twitter. And waiting for Meg to come out. <laughs> <laughs> Ashley Mova, where can the kids find you? Shut up, Meg. You guys can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. And last but not least is Wendy Lee Zaney. The Movie Couple channel on YouTube and on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, at Wendy Lee Zaney. I am merely Mark Ellis. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. You guys can find me on Twitter at Mark Ellis Live. And like I said, this weekend, we're all going to be at Star Wars Celebration. And Thursday through Saturday, I'll be performing stand-up comedy at the Improv right across the street from the convention center. Go to the con during the day. Come on over, see me, tell some yucks at night. And hopefully some of them are dad jokes that one day end up on the Jungle Cruise adventure. We'll see you guys right here tomorrow for Collider Movie Talk. Until then, sayonara. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.